is particularly interesting, and we'll talk a little bit about why, but all butterflies, their life cycle to me is just unbelievable. And so the overall life cycle up in the left, um, and then some close-ups on different stages. To me, uh, any creature that starts out the size of a pinhead and an egg and turns into what we all know is a butterfly, I, I, not to get religious, but it literally is one of those things that makes me believe there's got to be a higher power. And so just quickly walking through its life cycle, um, the egg turns into a caterpillar, and the caterpillar in and of itself is amazing because it starts out um, as this tiny little creature, and it actually molts five separate times uh, to become what we know as that really strikingly beautiful um, two-inch long caterpillar. So even some of the subparts of its life cycle are fascinating. And then, um, you can see here, um, the caterpillar uh, turns itself into the chrysalis, which again, just unbelievable to me, and eventually um, becomes transparent and goes through a whole process of becoming a butterfly. Um, so again, I can, I'm not going to talk, try not to talk too long, but I can probably talk about this all night, so I'm trying to give you the highlights. Um, So, monarchs are amazing because out of all butterflies, they are the only butterfly that actually migrates. So, like birds, the monarch actually does a two-way migration. It makes its way to the north, and something instinctively triggers inside of it, and monarchs, uh, it migrates back to um, the same location in central Mexico. Um, and that whole process, again, is pretty fascinating. <coughs> pretty evident here why this is so key. Oklahoma could actually be a tremendous part of this recovery. Um, we are, like I said, ground zero for both um, traveling north and then the actual migration. Um, it's, it's pretty interesting because as it makes its way um, to the north, there are actually three to four generations involved in that process. So once it leaves Mexico, um, it may only make it to Texas or Oklahoma, um, it'll lay eggs, those will hatch, they may make it to Ohio, lay eggs, hatch. So it can take up to four generations to actually get all the way up into Canada. So once, once that particular generation um, uh, hatches though, it does its entire return trip, it does its entire migration from uh, Canada down to Central Mexico, which is as much as 3,000 miles. It does that in one generation. Um, and again, um, I, I'm just fascinated by that. Uh, there are basically, the Rocky Mountains divide two different groups of monarchs. There is a monarch population that they call the Western monarch. It's the same species, but then there's the Eastern monarch. What we're really talking about, um, obviously, with our location, is the eastern monarch, and that's also the one that I'm going to uh, go over a few facts about its decline and, and what we can do to help it out. So this is a, an overview of the main concern that we have. Um, this is the overview for the overall land involved in Mexico, and this is the overall population. Um, like a lot of uh, species, We've known over the years that it can go up and down, um, but if you look at these last few years, what we're really becoming concerned about is there's been no recovery here. So typically we may have a crisis year. It could have been a bad winter. It could have been a particularly um, vicious uh, uh, illegal logging operation that affected the, the population of Mexico. Um, and again, you can see these, and then there typically are recovery years. Well, what we're falling into now is basically a permanent pattern of decline, and that's becoming critical. The eastern monarch population is down 90% of what we would expect it to be. So we're down to basically the same thing as the, um, the prairie. The prairie is down to, depending on, maybe 2 to 10% of what it once was. Um, so the population and the amount of land um, involved with the monarch in Central Mexico are both steeply in decline. How long has that decline happened? So is that just the last couple years or is just that been, been over 20 years or 30 years? Yeah, just been the last four or five years. Um, so before that, we would see a bad 
you know, we would see a bad season, but it would always re-spike and the numbers would always go back up. Um, but the fact that we have now had three going on four straight permanent declines, that's not happened, at least in terms of the years we've been keeping records. So this is really a new pattern, um, and that's why we're really concerned about it. Um, this is just some eye candy that hopefully motivate you when you get involved. So in Central Mexico, the, um, the native population there actually celebrates the monarch. You can find um, uh, art, artistic versions of the monarch going way back in history. It is something that has been revered and worshipped actually for quite a long time. Um, and you can actually see this in Texas, Oklahoma, whenever they're on migration, but this is a scene from down in central Mexico. It can literally just black out the sky when the migration is underway. It's just pretty stunning. Um, and specifically what they're making for, uh, it's called Oyamel. It's a particular fir tree in central Mexico. Problem with that is the fir tree is also highly prized for logging. Um, it's been illegally logged for decades, but just in the last 20 years, that operation has really stepped up. Um, also in the last 20 years, they finally, um, the Mexican government has finally uh, woken up to try and stop that. So they're trying to stop the illegal logging, but the bottom line is one of the biggest um, problems that we have that we can't control is the fact that they are illegally logging the fir trees out of the specific area where the monarchs go. They've made great strides. Um, they actually have rangers that are paid to work in that area now, so things are happening. Um, but again, when we're looking at year after year, 90% declines, we're still really concerned about being able to make a difference. Um, the reason they go there, uh, first of all, it's at altitude. The monarchs go to a site that's um, one to two miles high, it's between five and 10,000 feet, um, and the fir trees themselves, all of that microclimate basically keeps a really humid, constant environment, so the butterflies don't dry out, and it also keeps uh, a population where they can basically overwinter. It basically gives them a place to literally hang out until um, the following season when they can start making their way back north. Nobody knows why they go there, nobody knows what guides them there. These are questions that they've been researching for decades now, and that's why it's so fascinating to me. I mean, we've found these amazing things through scientific work over the past 50 years, and they still can't crack some of these issues. And I'm not gonna read this, but what this slide is, is so they did at least just late last year, actually in 2014, they have finally put forth a petition to um, get the monarch butterfly classified as an endangered species. So don't know where that process is, that goes, um, they do that in, in a scientific manner. I put the name of it because you can go online, I was not <laughs> gonna print it because it's about a 130, 30 page uh, petition. But if you go online, you can find that. It's called the Petition to Protect the Monarch Butterfly Under the Endangered Species Act. It was submitted in August of last year, so we're gonna stay hopeful and stay positive. Um, maybe we'll get some protection, um, but if you have an interest in this, go online and take a look at it. Um, it was an interesting group of pe people with a specific scientist that are driving this. And if you're interested in pollinators, go check out the Xerces Society. Um, and I'll take a minute here. I have several handouts. Um, this is an example of their publications. I don't know if I have enough for everybody, and I apologize if I didn't, but I, I wanted to run out rather than have, have, have these laying along, uh, around. But all three of these are related to bees and pollination in general and what you can do. Because again, I'm, I can probably rattle on and try and keep, keep this more interesting and lively. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. This is the spot I've seen on the uh, fiery home in Montana. Do they? Does color matter? More color, the more attractive, the brighter, more vivid, or does that not matter? Say that question, because I've got a, kind of an okay. interesting slide at the end that'll kind of speak to that. Okay. That's, that's an, an interesting point. Okay. Um, so, these are basically the big five. Um, I'm gonna start at the bottom. 
they have discovered that there is a specific parasite that is um, affecting monarchs as well. It's not the, the biggest reason, but they, they have at least identified that, so there's some hope that they can um, figure out a way to counteract that parasite. We've already talked about the illegal logging. Climate change, um, we have a lot of people talking about climate change uh, and then um, basically, I'm sure all of you have heard that, that term, the butterfly effect. And so I find that pretty fascinating that, um, ironically, the butterfly effect, um, which is the idea that we, we honestly don't know, those of you who subscribe to the Gaia principle, which I do, that we live in a single ecosystem, everything within our biosphere is connected in one way or another. The reason that is fascinating to me is because we know climate change, one degree to two degree difference is having a drastic effect on the overall migration pattern of this one creature. So I can only imagine how that, you know, how that trickles out to all the species that are um, related to it. But what I, what I find fascinating is, again, they don't know the connections and the reasons that the, the monarch follows this migration pattern. So the reason that concerns me is because that tells me they don't know what all the effect is. If this species goes away, it's not one species going away, it's a piece of that puzzle being taken out. And Anybody who's built a puzzle knows that if that puzzle's incomplete, it's basically you know, not fulfilling its mission. So the biosphere, through the loss of one species, can still be affected. 